Friday morning, my mom passed away at the age of 90. It was a peaceful passing into the presence of Christ and hope of resurrection. In the days <clears throat> leading up to that, we had our goodbyes. We were able to do that, to speak of our love, because in the end, love alone is credible, and to read scripture. And the scripture that gives us hope, the hope of the gospel. Here's what I've learned this past week. The only gospel that is worth anything is a gospel that works at the deathbed of a loved one. And this is the gospel we have in Jesus Christ. In March of 2020, I was visiting Dormition Abbey on Mount Zion in Jerusalem with a small group of people. And we went down into the crypt underneath the church. This is, this is a site to mark the traditional site of the death of the Virgin Mary. So dormition meaning to fall asleep. The, the death or the falling asleep of, of the Virgin Mary. And in the crypt, I saw a fresco that I took a picture of. You know, I have, uh, it's a Benedictine monastery there, Dormition Abbey. And I since have talked to numerous Benedictines and asked them if they've ever seen something like this. Is this part of their iconic tradition? And everybody says no. So I think it's an unusual icon, this fresco. I absolutely love it. I've found comfort in it this week. So look at it here with me. At the bottom you have the Virgin Mary on her deathbed in repose. Surrounded by apostles. But above her, you have Jesus. And then in the arms of Jesus, you have the living Mary. Yeah, that's, that's the same person. As a child, as a newborn, wrapped in, well, grave clothes or swaddling clothes? Well, yes, both. So that... So that Mary's death here is portrayed also as a birth into a new life. And that you'll notice that the, the upper image is, is a reversal of the iconic image. You think of Madonna with child, Mary holding Jesus. Now it's switched. And now Jesus is holding Mary. So now as, as Mary cared for Christ, now Christ cares for Mary at her death. This world is a womb. This present world is but a womb. And trying to understand the world to come is probably like a babe in the womb trying to understand the world into which they are about to be born, which is to say it's nearly impossible. There's a baby in the womb. The baby likes it in the womb. The baby has everything it needs in the womb. But the baby may be aware of a world beyond the womb. I mean, now and then the baby hears things out there. Occasionally feels things. Maybe the baby begins to speculate. Is there life after death? Is there a world beyond this world? I don't know. It's a mystery. And then one day, the baby has to leave the womb, the world that it has always known, the only world it has ever known, and the baby is not happy about it. That's why we all, each and every one, come into this world screaming. Because we don't want to come to this world, because we think we're dying. How else could it be? We think we're dying. We think it's the worst thing that could ever happen is happening right now. No, happy birthday. You've been born. It's just beginning. 
I think that's a lot what death in Christ is like. Yeah, we, we think we're coming to the end. We think the worst thing that can happen is happening. We're dying. We're being born into the age to come. Now, I've been using this world as a womb metaphor for over a year now, and I find it helpful. But just last month, I read Maximus the Confessor, one of the greatest church fathers, saying the same thing in the 7th century. That really made me feel good. (laughs) Max is with me on this. I'm going to read just a little snippet of that. It comes from a, a, a passage where Maximus is commenting on when Jesus and John the Baptist first met. And it wasn't at the River Jordan. Remember, Jesus and John the Baptist first meet when they are both in the wombs of their mothers, Mary and Elizabeth. Commenting on that, Maximus the Confessor writes, For many people, this may be a jarring and unusual thing to say, though it is true nonetheless. Both we ourselves and the Word of God, the Creator and Master of the universe, exist in a kind of womb owing to the present condition of our life. Human beings gazing through the womb of the material world catch but a glimpse of the word who is concealed within beings. For when compared to the ineffable glory and splendor of the age to come and to the kind of life that awaits us there, this present life differs in no way from a womb swathed in darkness. Amen. I find great comfort in knowing that my mother has entered the glory of the ages to come. My mom liked my preaching. (laughs) Of course she did. My mom liked my preaching. Some of you remember, you know, she would come for many years. She came on Friday nights. Uh, She liked my preaching. And so today I'll preach my sermon in her honor, a sermon I'll call Christ of all things. Today we've reached the end of the church calendar that tells the story of Jesus throughout the course of the year. The final Sunday of ordinary time, before we will start again, next Sunday we start over. Next Sunday really is our New Year's for the church. We begin with Advent, first Sunday of Advent. But today we've come to the end of the long, year-long story, telling the story of Jesus through the calendar. And the final Sunday of, of ordinary time, the last Sunday of the church calendar, is called Christ the King Sunday. The idea is we, be, we begin, we begin you know, on Advent anticipating the coming of Christ, and then we go all the way through the year, hitting all the highlights. And then at the, the last thing we do is we acknowledge that Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So this is Christ the King Sunday. The gospel reading from the lectionary for Christ the King Sunday is a brilliant selection. It comes, you just heard it, from the crucifixion account in the gospel of Luke. Luke 23, verse 33 is where it begins, and I'll read that first verse. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. So why is this the gospel reading for Christ the King Sunday? If this, if this is the Sunday where we emphasize that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, why is the gospel reading a crucifixion account? Well, because crucifixion is the true coronation of the King of Kings. Don't ever forget that. When is Christ crowned king. It's on Good Friday in his crucifixion. His procession, 
his royal procession to assume the throne was to carry his cross through town. His crown was made of thorns, his reed, his scepter was a reed, and his throne was the cross itself. And as Jesus ascends to his throne to begin his reign, these are the words he speaks. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The kingdom of Christ is the kingdom of forgiveness. This is the moment when the sin of the world coalesces into a hideous singularity that it might be forgiven in mass. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And Christ begins his reign not by killing as so many other kings do, but by laying down his life and forgiving all of our sins. Now gathered around the throne of Christ, that is his cross, there were those that derided him, the chief priests and the Roman soldiers among them. One of the criminals crucified with Christ joined in this mockery. And he said, well, if you're the Christ, if you're the Messiah, then save yourself and us. But another criminal said, no, don't say that. Don't you have any fear of God? Look, man, we played for high stakes and we got caught and we're getting what's coming to us. But this one is innocent. This one has done nothing wrong. And this criminal looks at the inscription Upon the throne, that is the cross of Christ. And it reads, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And he believes it. What faith. What faith. I don't know if there's any greater faith found in the gospel stories than the faith of the dying criminal who reads, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, and believes he is the king coming into a kingdom. And he prays, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today, you will be with me in paradise. Christ upon the cross is Christ saving the world. But how effective is the saving work of Christ upon the cross? That is, upon his throne. Well, to answer that question, we need to go to the New Testament reading out of the lectionary for Christ the King Sunday, which is it's in the epistle, it's in Colossians. So we're going to go to Colossians 1, but before that, I need to say a few words about poetry because we're going to encounter poetry. I know you're just thrilled, but bear with me. This will be good for you. Poetry is the best vehicle we have for attempting to articulate the ineffable. This is why so much of the Bible is poetry, not just the obvious poetry of the Psalms, the writings, the literary prophets in the Old Testament, but much of what we find in the New Testament as well. The Gospels and Epistles are far more poetic than we are accustomed to recognizing. And what is the book of Revelation if not a phantasmic poem? The Bible is the product of a poetic age, the age of Homer and Isaiah, the age of Virgil and John the Revelator. But we do not live in a poetic age. We live in a technical age, a digital age of ones and zeros. We live in what Walter Brueggemann calls a prose flattened age. The dominant language of our time languishes, the dominant language of our time languishes under the tyranny of prose. This has a quashing effect upon our attempts to do creative theology. We don't want Theopoetics. That is, we don't want theology presented as poetry. We're opposed to that. We don't like that. Sound. We're suspicious of that. What we want is an owner's manual on God, a very modern move. We tell ourselves that prose is precise when it's mostly just unimaginative. A spirit inspired imagination is necessary for theological progress. There is an open-endedness in poetry that allows for an ongoing development and future interpretation. We see this again and again as the New Testament writers reinterpret 
the poems of the Hebrew prophets creatively in the light of Christ. I mean, you have, you have all these poems in the Old Testament by the Hebrew prophets that meant something, meant one thing when they were first presented, these inspired poems that we call scripture. But then you get those, those poems wind up in the hands of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter, John the Revelator, and they give fresh new interpretation to them in the light of Christ. Those who crave the fixedness of certitude tend to be frustrated by the fluidity of poetry. Where prose gets stuck in a cul-de-sac, poetry opens up to new vistas. So now, now we're ready to turn to Paul, who was far more of a poet than he gets credit for. I mean, when he wasn't forced to do the, to do the nitty-gritty pastoral work like telling the Corinthians to refrain from suing one another and to stop getting drunk at the Lord's table, he could actually be quite poetic. I mean, think of his famous ode to love that we know as 1 Corinthians 13 that you hear at almost every wedding. The opening line is as famous as any Shakespeare sonnet. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Well, that's poetry. And Paul is at his best when he leans into theopoetics. That is, when he takes a poetic approach to his theology. One of the finest examples of this is found in the first chapter of his epistle to the Colossians, where Paul contemplates the supremacy of Christ in splendid poetry. Now, if I were to give a name to Paul's poem, I would call it Christ of all things. And so I'm going to read this Theopoetics of Paul to you, that is Colossians 1, 13 through 20, that I call Christ of all things. And I want you to pay attention to the six times that you will hear all things. This is fantastic. This is, this is some of the best stuff in all the Bible. He has released us from the power of darkness. And transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in all things. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things." whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the cross. That's about as high as you can go in Christology. If you want to talk about the greatness of Christ, you cannot climb any higher than Paul does in his all things, Christ of all things, theopoetics. The six claims that Paul makes concerning Christ in his All Things poem are just astounding, stunning, the claims that he makes. Let's look at them. Christ is before all things. All right. This Jewish former Pharisee who's come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, he's writing a letter, and he says that Christ is before all things. Christ eternally proceeds from the eternal one. In other words, Christ has no beginning. Do you understand it? Christ has no beginning. Christ eternally proceeds from the eternal one before in the beginning there was the eternal son. It's before all things. Christ has first place in all things. There is no equal to Christ. There is no equal to Christ. We, we, we will not speak of those that are equal to Christ. No. No. 
No great saint or sage, no great angel or spirit is equal to Christ. That's why my boast is in Christ. My boast is in Christ. I mean, it, you, you, could, you could misinterpret it as just petty religious triumphalism. No, I've just, I just believe what Paul says about Christ. That he has first place in all things. I mean, he did stuff like this. He descended into our death that he might bring us into his resurrection. No one else does that. No one else was going to do that. No one else was capable. He has first place in all things. All things were created in and through Christ. How about that? All things were created in and through Christ. Did God create ex nihilo? Or maybe something else. The dominant view has been that, that God created ex nihilo, out of nothing. There's nothing, out of nothing God creates all that is. But Maximus the Confessor had a different idea. And Maximus is like Perry, he's almost always right. <laughs> Maximus says, well, it's not so much that God created ex nihilo, that God created ex dio, out of God. God creates not out of nothing, but out of his own God self. The Logos, Christ. I, in the beginning was the Logos, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things were made by him and apart from him, and nothing was made that was made. Amen. Ah. All things were created for Christ. Well, hold on now. These aren't, we're not just playing around with a bunch of prepositions. This is, this is heavy duty stuff. All things are created by Christ for Christ. All things find their true telos, their true end in Christ. So here's a, here's a question that, that I'm not going to answer for you. I'm just going to let it just, it, you just take it home with you. You take this question home with you and let it work on you all week. Will Christ eternally lose anything created by and for him? Will Christ eternally lose anything created by and for him? In Christ, all things hold together. In the final end, the world will not tear itself apart because Christ, upon the cross, I, th I think of his arms outstretched. Part of what he's doing is he's holding all things together. Amen. The world could fall apart, tear itself asunder. There are forces toward that end, but there is the one upon the cross who holds all things together. Jesus Christ is the center that holds. And in Christ, God has reconciled all things. Reconciled. Brought back home, brought back together. All things. Paul is at his best when he speaks of Christ and all things. Let me show you another all things passage in Paul's writings. This is more prose than poetry, but... It's also awesome. This is an all things passage in 1 Corinthians 15, 27 and 28. Pay attention to all the alls. In these two verses, you're going to hear seven alls. Pay attention to all the alls. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will be subjected to the one who put all things in subjection under him so that God may be all in all. All things, all things, all things, all things, all things, all in all. Paul is daring. You want to say, so, so what you're saying, Paul, is you have a pretty high opinion of Jesus. <laughs> yes. 
The accomplishment of the Christ of all things is that in the end, God will be all in all. This is why we insist that evil is not eternal, but only temporal. Evil is real. It inflicts real damage, real pain, real sorrow. But it's only temporal. It's not eternal. Why? Because it wasn't created by Christ for Christ. All things are created by Christ and for Christ so that evil is only a transitory wound. It is a wound. It's a severe wound. It's a real wound. But it is a wound that is temporary. It's a wound that will be healed. For by his wounds we are healed. Because Jesus is the Christ of all things, in the end, everything's going to be all right. Because Jesus is the Christ of all things. In the end, everything's going to be all right. I, I, st I stand right up here on my hind legs and say that on a Sunday morning and believe it. Because Jesus is the Christ of all things. In the end, everything's going to be all right. And that, of course, reminds us of Paul's most famous all things saying. You know it. Romans 8, 28. For we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Now, I'm very aware that lately, it seems like every sermon I preach, I keep returning to the same few themes. I can't help it. I mean, it doesn't matter what text you give me, what occasion I'm preaching, what it is I'm trying to do. It's like there's this gravitational pull that just keeps pulling me back to these. I think, well, I'll do something different this week. And then I get caught in this tractor beam where I've just got a few themes. And no matter what I try to preach on, it keeps coming out the same lately. I mean, I'm aware of that. Uh, themes like, you hear me say all the time, the world will be saved because Jesus is the Savior of the world. I just keep saying that every sermon. I don't put it in my notes. It just it comes out. Well, you know, the world's going to be saved because Jesus is the Savior of the world. God didn't send his son to condemn the world. He sent his son to save the world. The son doesn't go back and say, Dad, you don't know how hard it was. They're, they're way messed up. I don't know. No, the word does not return void without accomplishing that for which God sent it. And Jesus is the word. Jesus doesn't come back and say, Father, I tried. Those people are whacked. No. The world will be saved because Jesus is the Savior of the world. I've been saying that a lot. I've been talking a lot, about, a lot about the hope that we have is what Peter called the restoration of all things. Acts 3.21. He speaks of apocatastasis. The restoration of... Oh, there's another all things one for you. I don't know if you notice it in our prayer. As you pray the prayer for the week, this week, right there, it's, there's an all things in it. And so the, the hope, the eschatological hope we have is the restoration of all things I've been talking about. I just keep coming back to that. I can't get away from it. I keep harping on and on about this thing, about how, how evil is only temporal. In the end, God will be all in all. This is, this is why the devil has great wrath. He knows his time is short. That is limited. I mean, pick whatever number you want. If you, if you want to say the time of the devil's evil is a million years compared to eternity, that's short. It's temporal. The devil has great wrath because he knows his time is short, limited. You know, the, the eschatological focus, that's a big word I, I use means, you know, last things. Where's this headed? How's it, you know, you ever, you ever cheat? You know, you're reading a novel and you just go, well, how does this thing end anyway? The eschatological focus of the gospel is not on an inevitable cataclysm of some kind, but on an inevitable restoration of all things. With God being all in all. End time preachers who go on and on and they rant endlessly about doom and gloom get it all wrong. They're just fear mongers. 
Because Jesus is the Christ of all things, in the end, everything's going to be all right. And so I keep, I keep saying, I keep saying that uh, the world's going to be saved because Jesus is the Savior of the world. I keep saying that uh, the hope we have is the restoration of all things. I keep saying uh, evil's only temporal. It's not eternal. And I keep coming back to Lady Julian of Norwich. In her 13th revelation of divine love, I can't hardly preach a sermon anymore when, I'm not, when I just don't find myself saying, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. I know I just keep coming back to these. I'm just drawn to them. But here's the thing. Nobody's complaining. <laughs> oh, I get people complaining about my sermons. I've, I've, you know, I've had my share of that over the years, believe me. No one's complaining about this. Because it's good news. It's the good news of the gospel. We get enough bad news from Monday through Saturday. There's nothing wrong with coming in here on Sunday morning and just hearing good news. Amen. Good news. And the good news that I have for you this Sunday morning and probably last Sunday morning and probably next Sunday morning, the good news I have this Sunday morning is all shall be well. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, because Jesus is the Christ of all things. Amen and amen. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. Ah. Christ of all things. We boast in Christ because he does that. And so now we come to the table of the Lord that we might participate in the body and blood of Christ. Then we prepare ourselves by confessing our faith, confessing our sins, and receiving the forgiveness that is at the heart of the kingdom of Christ. Join with me in our confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now join with me in confessing our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name, amen. When Jesus ascended his throne and from the cross said, Father, forgive them, the Son was not acting as an agent of change upon the Father. The Father does not change. The Father is immutable. The Father doesn't mutate. Rather, Jesus was revealing who God is. That's why in his poem, the Apostle Paul said he's the image of the invisible God, the icon of the God we've not yet seen. It's, as we look at Jesus, we know that God is like Jesus. When Jesus says, Father, forgive them, the Father says, yes, son, that's who we are. And God is merciful to all who confess their sins. And in humility, ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. Because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. 
the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen.